Welcome to the Institute of East Asian Studies and its program at the, uh, during the Tsinghua Week at Berkeley. My name is uh, Wen Xin Ye. I am a professor of history in the Department of History here at Berkeley, and I am also director of the Institute of East Asian Studies. And the session, the first session this afternoon, is about religion or religious encounters between China and the West historically from the early middle period to the 16th century. And I am very pleased to present as our speaker, Professor Zhang Guogang, who is the chair of the Department of History of Tsinghua University in Beijing. Professor Zhang received his uh, educational training at Nankai University. That is, he received his doctorate there. And I suspect that, by and large, he's more familiar with European settings rather than American settings. He spent many years as a visitor, as a researcher, and as a resident instructor in German universities, including uh, University of Berlin. So um, his research, Professor Zhang is the author of several important volumes in Chinese that examine cultural and religious encounters along the ancient Silk Road, connecting across Eurasian overland, connecting the West and China, and primarily in areas of cultures and religions. So um, the uh, presentation this afternoon is entitled Religious Encounters in uh, cult uh, Chinese Culture and Imported Religions, Buddhism, Nestorianism, and Catholicism, and their comparative um, destinies in terms of disseminations in China. This is a very important piece of work which examines the question both about the adoption as well as adaptation of foreign cultures and religions within the Chinese context and doing so from a comparative historical perspective. So um, without further ado, let me turn to Professor Zhang to make his uh, presentation. He will be making his presentation in Chinese, and it's going to be followed by um, brief translations. Please, Professor Zhang, and would you please come up? Professor Ye, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, uh, colleagues, uh, I can't speak English uh, for our academic uh, topics, uh, but uh, uh, with the help of uh, um, uh, Mr. Shi. <laughs> Mr. Shi, oh, okay. Shi. Shi, okay. Uh, 这是一个很大的题目 it's a very large topic, uh, and what I'm looking to do today is to bring about a useful dialogue um, for scholars of different disciplines. And the frame, you could say, is as long as 2,000 years ago when Buddhism first entered China. Mm. Um, we想从三个方面简单地讲, 是世界人类文明史上一个非常伟大的事件，因为两个意志的文明，它如此水乳交融的啊，产生了一个啊新的结果啊，在世界文明史上是罕见的。
uh, I will speak um, today on three main uh, themes. The first one is the um, dissemination of Buddhism in China, which is one of the great historical um, motions uh, in terms of world history. Uh, Ta 年代上的这个说法，但是我们一般认为是两汉之际，就是说，呃，怎么说，就是在正好在耶稣受受难前后那个时代吧，耶稣诞生和受难前后那个时代，呃，传中国的。嗯。Um, uh, the Buddha himself was born in what would today be called Nepal, and this is a picture of one of the earliest Buddhist uh, temples in China. And it, before it was changed by uh, Empress Wu Zetian, it was even more Indian looking. Namma 中国小说《西游记》的那个原型、那个唐僧的原型，他们啊，这个呃是扮演了这个两种文化呃的传播的这个使者的角色，既有外国人，但是更多的是中国人主动去取经的。uh, Buddhism uh, first entered China between the Eastern and Western Han periods, which happens to be around the time of the birth and death of Christ. Um, but the active period of seeking uh, scriptures was during the Tang Dynasty by famous monks um, such as Tang Xunzong. Uh, 这里有个特点uh, the process of translation uh, began with foreign monks translating the scriptures um, in in Chinese, but um, they would be from a foreign land. And in the Tang period, it began to be uh, Chinese monks who would be actively incorporating uh, these terms. Before我们这里如果学中文的我们就知道第一组很多现在这个汉字比如涅盘呢波若菩提等等这完全是从佛教翻译经典翻译过来的过去没有这个词啊这个音译啊变成中文的词第二个呢就是有中文词但是新造的
。第二个方面就是佛教艺术啊，佛教艺术那是很多啊，我们在座里可能有啊，有的教授是研究佛教艺术的，我就不我这里列了个表啊，讲了他如何从石窟、绘画、建筑啊、舞蹈等音乐的影响。呃，我不详细讲，比如说我们就看看这个图，那这两幅图呢，雕塑呢。这是卡布尔啊，今天阿富汗那当时佛教圣地啊，今天中亚的那个伊斯兰教的地方，过去其实包括新疆都是佛教的这个呃这个天国，呃这个佛像呢，哎，非常印度啊，非常这个西方，但是到中国呢，你看啊，从山西大同的，到这个啊龙洛阳龙门的，呃这些佛像呢，它中国化了啊，就是佛教传到中国，咱们不是照搬的。它一定是西或者中国的创造，但是这也不像完全是像中国本土的，所以它是两种文化结合的一个新的这个佛教造型模式。如果说把这个搬过来，那就没什么意思了，对吧？哎，中国人赋予了新的创造，从大同的石窟、云冈的石窟，不光是石窟是这样，从寺庙、绘画等等都是这样子的啊，有有新的创造。Um, another form of absorption of Buddhist culture was through art, including um, music and trance and sculpture. So from the slides, you'll be able to see um, earlier, uh, earlier sculptures uh, of the Buddha that, that look more Indian. Um, the first slide is from Kabul. Um, but as, it, as you get closer into China, you'll notice that the, the sculptures become more and more signified in style, but not entirely nativized. They're not entirely um, a Chinese production. And what you see is a sort of hybrid art form. So, when the Chinese people come to the 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 啊，比如佛教，比如说，特别是用佛教来比如道家，啊，道家，呃，我们在考古发现这个时代的啊，汉魏时期佛有所谓先佛模式，先就是佛教的先啊，先人，佛就是啊，先就是道教的这个神啊，佛呢就是呃，释迦牟尼，呃，这种中国人用佛教来理解道家啊，呃，讲讲呃，用道家来理解佛教，那。呃，讲佛典的时候，人听不懂啊，别人就用庄子来理来解释啊。那么听的人呢，一下就明白了，那、啊、就是或者小然啊，这个这迷惑的人呢，不明白的人呢，啊，他一下子就明白了啊，一下子就明白了。用道教来解释，用庄子来解释，他一下子就明白了。所以说这是隔义啊，叫做隔义，就用中国的思想来理解佛教的思想。Uh, one of the ways in which the ideas and concepts were translated or hybridized was that um, people would use existing ideas from Taoism or Zhuangzi, etc., to explain Buddhist concepts. And this made it much easier for people to understand. Okay. 中亚来的一个佛教高僧，他在这里在在使用法术啊，谢谢，使用法术来灭北京城的发的大火，北京城发火了，哎，佛教高僧用个法术来灭火，这这这就是这这真正的佛教没有这个，这是按照中国道家来理解的啊。It's a picture of a monk from the far west putting out a fire in Beijing. And this sort of depiction uh, isn't a very Indian sort of um, depiction. It, it can only kind of arise from a Taoist imagination. Actually,后面我就没时间讲了，比如他还通过迎合啊，特别是在孝道啊，我我我跟着我的研究，我写过一篇文章，中国的二十四孝，这是佛教编的啊，这个人呢就是一个活人叫袁建啊编的，我们最
。这个二十四孝是中国典型的这个文化代表，被认为啊，宋宋代以后，但实际上是佛教编的啊，不是儒家的。嗯，那最后当然发生冲突、争论啊等等啊，我比如说他们说这个这个老子啊。呃，出出关到了印度，找了个学生，学生名字叫释迦牟尼啊，就是用这些办法啊，这个这个最后呢，实际上呢就导致的就是佛教中国化、本土化啊，本土化最最最典型的呢啊，红花、白藕、青莲叶三教原来是一家，儒释道合成了一个体系，特别是宋明理学这个体系，就是这样子结果啊，宋明的理学这是佛教的，这是中国儒教的一个阶段啊。但它实际上是儒释道融合的结果。你看，本土化了，佛教非常圆融无碍地融入了中国文化，啊，甚至产生了新的这个中国文化的一些新的这个内容。嗯，简单。嗯。And then you have other sort of controversies and conflicts that lead to other resolutions that may end up having, you know, creating stories such as sages taking the Buddha as a student or um, sayings that combine Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism as part of the same sort of system. So it's really kind of become truly nativized in this sense. It's mixing with all the other thought systems. Look, we 这个女这个女儿佛教嫁到了婆家中国，你看，对方又是这个娘家不干涉啊，文化输入不干涉，所以她能够圆融无碍的跟中国文化融合生存。今天印度已经没有佛教了，但是在中国呢，就成为中国人的宗教啊，而且是世界文明的一个奇迹。但是这个第二个呢，佛教内容很丰富，它能给中国文化提供新的东西啊，所以呢。To make an analogy, we could say that India is the birth family of Buddhism, whereas China is the sort of in-laws family that the woman marries into. And because the birth family did not interfere over much with the goings on of their daughter in her new home, she was able to become part of the new family and enter her new life. So you could say that it, it, this, this helped a lot, but it also helped that uh, Buddhism had a lot to provide to Chinese culture. And it might even be said to have a stronger life in China now than in India, where it originated. This 呃，跟我们传统的啊，认为的那些特立派不不完全一样。这景教传入中国的情况，我就不详细讲了啊。这这最有名的就是中国景教碑，这是十七世纪的时候啊，十七世纪的时候，呃，耶稣会士他们在西安发现的，发现简直是被称为世界第一碑。居然中国那么早啊，在公元八世纪的时候，呃，天主教就传到中国了，对他们来说当时是个奇迹，因为他们要说服中国人，你看，你看，你们其实是信教的啊。那么这个碑文很多，内容很多啊。它里你看，这是这还包括我们最近在洛阳发现的啊，前几年刚刚最前几年在洛阳发现的是景教的材料。那么他们的传播特点呢，可以说这里这个续听续听迷啊，续听迷，这个这个这首诗其实其实认为可以说是这个啊基督教的这个啊的内容的总纲领。那么为什么景教最后在中国传失败呢？各种原因很多，但是我想啊，呃，我想可以我们简单的讲就是什么呢？就是他，他主要是他，我刚才跟这个啊，呃，这个海伦娜也讲这个，他他实际上他，他的特色不清楚，啊，他特色不清楚，就是他中国人把他看成佛教的一致，啊，他也讲天堂，讲地狱，但是他他没有这个没有自己的特点啊，没有自己的特点。呃，当然，他的这个翻译工作做得不够啊，再加上他最后呢，其实，呃，因为他这个啊，他呃，他更多的依赖着是唐朝皇室来传教，当唐朝灭亡，他也就很难生存。总之吧，景教在中国传播呢，走向了一个自生自灭的道路，没有什么太大的结果。嗯。To go very quickly through Nestorianism, or really the 
Persian Church of the East. Um, it was discovered when missionaries entered China um, in the in the seventeenth century that there was this uh, there was a sort of Christian legacy from much earlier from the seventh century, um, and they kind of used it to to prove that uh, there was a history of Christianity in in China. Um, and among the, uh, the most important documents is this Christian stele, I guess you could call it, um, with a, a scripture or sutra of listening to the Messiah. Um, and it, basically, it includes a lot of information, including uh, most of the sort of core beliefs from the scriptures or from the gospels. You can 这是紧教的特色十字架但是这些人的脸是佛教的这是飘带是安哲是这个是有这个有希腊文化的但是它有中国道教语言的这个非天的这个形象所以在中国这各种东西都加在一起了在那边这个基督教跟伊斯兰教
第一个回合是托钵修会，他认为中国的这些东西呢，是是一种迷信，啊，祭祀祖先、祭祀孔子是多神崇拜，这跟一神论，天主教的是有冲突的，啊。Um, so the controversy that destroyed all the sort of merging, hybridizing um, uh, designs of Matteo Ricci um, began with the arrival of the mendicants who felt that um, the worship of family, ancestors, and Confucian, uh, Confucian forms of ceremonial rites were heretic and not um, part of any sort of monotheistic Christian practice. 佛教当初是用道教来解释自己。佛教当初编出二十四孝，已经适应中国。但是天主教传入呢，按照利玛窦的设想是挺好的。但是后来这些传教士呢，他挑战中国传统化的核心价值——孔子和祖先。So at first, the policy of accommodation seemed to be mixing with these different forms of thought, the way that Buddhism had mixed with um, Taoism and, and Confucianism. But this controversy attacked the very core beliefs of, um, of, of ancestor worship and, and of Confucian um, sages. 这里面其实还有国家利益的冲突，就是法国人和葡萄牙人的冲突。啊，耶稣会士的背后是葡萄牙人。但是这个巴黎外方传教会呢，它虽然也是天主教，它背后是法国的利益。尽管葡萄牙人犹如这个大航海的发现，他最先到远东啊，这个谋求他的利益。但是法国人呢，后来住上，所以他不能容属，也这也是他们内部的一个冲突啊。这个我曾经写过文章表述，但是我去讲，从我们的课题来讲呢，接着来讨论这个问题的就是。巴黎外方传教会，我们千万不要以为它是宗教内部修会真正是对这个原教旨的理解，原教旨背后实际上是他们世俗的利益，啊，不要把他们看成他们真正是坚持基督教的教义，他们不过是背后的世俗利益影响了他们对其他一些修会的这个态度，啊。Behind this controversy was uh, the the conflict between interests of different European nations that the missionaries came from, including Portugal and France. And so it wasn't entirely a question of dogmatic um, debate uh, or, you know, over, over the actual teachings of Christ, but it was, it was also involved in very secular concerns. So, in the end, this is not the case. He said, is this a Christian faith? 康熙皇帝，你给我说说吧。他们请康熙皇帝写了一个一个东西来对天、对上帝这解释。这些也是会是把康熙的指示呢翻译成拉丁文，一同送到了梵蒂冈，送到罗马。送到罗马以后呢，大家知道，这更加触动了罗马教廷的敏感神经，因为在欧洲就是世俗的王权来向宗教权力夺权。对吧？这就是所谓启蒙运动。现在居然在海外传教，一个世俗君王在跟我们教会内部的是非说三道四，他们不能容忍。Uh, so uh, Claudio Filippo Grimaldi, a Jesuit in Beijing, in the Beijing court, asked uh, the Emperor Kangxi to write an explanation of exactly what the ceremonial practices were and explain this to uh, the the Roman. Um, seat of power, and this actually struck a most sensitive nerve at this time in Rome because this was post-Reformation, and um, the the battle between um, European national um, national monarch monarchs and and uh, the central power in Rome was a very sort of constant thorn in the side of the Holy See, and so this created. A great amount of controversy back in in Rome. We in the Vatican Museum found many Catholic priests writing to the Pope, hoping that they would not be so blatant in their opposition to Western values, hoping that they would respect Western Catholic values. But it was all a big mess. Finally, the Pope sent a letter to Beijing. This is Kangxi meeting with him three times. Every time, he hoped that he could give an explanation to him. 但是这个使节认为啊，他是来宣传教皇的命令的，根本没有必要就这么一个问题同异教君王进行讨论。他说我是来宣布的，没什么可讨论的啊，所以他始终搪塞。最后在康熙的言辞威胁下，没法讨论了。
他说我没有足够的知识，请请这个在中国的一个一个一个主教叫严当是法国人啊，来来详细解解释吧。但是康熙在任何接近他的时候，让指着这背后的这个字说你能够认识这个字吗？他根本不认识啊，这这连康熙非常生气，你连中国字都不认识，你还说中国的是非，所以他就觉得这是啊，你们都是在不可理喻啊，不可理喻。那么最后呢，这个当然是。这个他就教廷在中国的教士必须要领一个证，我想这是最早的签证，可能是啊，就像我们今天签证一样的，你在中国来，你必须有一个中国批准，一个签证，你才能在这传教，所以叫领票。呃，到最后呢，教皇又派了使节来了，啊，派了使节来，希望来就这个两方很激烈冲突能够有所、啊、回旋的余地。康熙一而再、再而再的派使节到罗马去，希望他们解释啊，解释中国的教徒能够遵从中国的习俗，能够拜祭祖先孔子。有的使节在路上就死了，有的使节呢回来了，但是回来呢，还是原来的任命，啊，就是不能够违背任何天主教的仪式，必须要既不能拜孔子，也不能拜祖先。康熙呢非常这个，那、啊、非常生气，所以他就写，最后在这个教宗的这个宪章上、译文上批，以后不比西洋人在中国行教，禁止可以，免得多事。Okay, so um, in the next two rounds of, of this battle, um, the Pope sent his envoy, Charles Thomas Maillard de Toulon, to China um, and had very unsuccessful meetings with Kangxi because he felt like that he was just there to announce the Pope's um, dictums and there was nothing to discuss and it ended up in a, the creation of those um, visas for any missionaries who wanted to practice in China. Um, in the next uh, round, there was uh, another envoy sent, Charles Ambrose Mesa Barbara, and uh, he basically was just there to deliver the Pope's, uh, the Pope's answer, answer to Kangxi, which is basically, you must follow um, all, of, all of the rules. There's going to be no ancestor worship or uh, Confucius worship. And this, of course, uh, brought Kangxi to the end of his patience, and he declared that there would be no more uh, foreign missionaries in China. Oh, right. And there was an episode um, where the priest came to him, and uh, they were discussing, and Kangxi asked him, what does this character say? And he couldn't even understand that. <laughs> Um, so he lost all respect for <laughs> this man who was his interlocutor. 一九三九年，罗马教皇，一九三九年，那罗马教皇啊，两百多年以后发表宣布啊声明，容许中国天主教徒按照中国的礼仪祭拜孔子和祖先。是非已经很清楚了，就是罗马教皇他说他错了，对不对？他不该这样做了。但是迟到了两百多年，让两百年前那场本来可以顺利进行的中西文化的对话夭折了，啊，所以我们今天想想，如果我们现在也有些西方人啊，他用自己的主见，他说你应该如何如何，如果在两百年前以后才说他错了，那就麻烦了啊，所以历史的经验呢，值得我们呢继续。Um, the Vatican did announce that Chinese Catholics would be able to practice their ceremonial rites in 1939, but it was about 200 years too late. And so, of course, uh, Christianity was uh, kind of dead for, in the water for 200 years in China. And this is kind of um, what we can look at today as a sort of lesson of history. Don't be 200 years late with your apology. So I think that from these three examples, 中国文化和外来宗教的关系，它最后的命运和结果，会看出呢。我想，应该是啊，应该是 tolerance 啊，应该是宽容，应该是让他们文化之间呢，他们有个自己啊，能够交流和融合。任何政治力的干涉都会啊，造来很啊非常这个糟糕的结果，或者是自己原教旨主义啊，以为只有我的文化才是唯我独尊的啊。我想，就像这个费孝通啊先生有一句很好的话，这是我们清华校友。他说：“各美其美，美人之美，美美与共，天下大同。”这个美呢，就是一种文化。就每个人呢，都称赞自己的文化是美的啊，都说自己老婆是美的啊。美人之美，也称赞别人的老婆是美的，也称赞别人的文化是美的。各种美呢，都共同的存在啊。大家和而不同，天下呢，啊
啊，从一个这个和谐的局面啊。我想这个这个所谓文化相对主义，尽管是个老的这个概念啊，但是它有它的合理性。And so the conclusion we might reach is that tolerance is probably always the better policy. Um, and to bring back a sense of cultural relativism, this quote from a Tsinghua alum <laughs> is that you think your own wife is beautiful and others' wives are beautiful. And if everybody can be beautiful together, then it will be happy and harmonious, <laughs> basically. So um, on the other hand, any attempt to politically control with a strong hand um, what happens with culture and religion ends disastrously. Uh, thank you, Professor Zhang. Um, if we take uh, 30 seconds for very brief questions, just for purposes of clarification about the main points, this is obviously a very rich paper drawing upon um, the, the worth of many volumes of research and with very deep grounding in uh, European sinology. So um, for discussants, we turn first to Professor Nicholas Takic, professor of history who teaches um, the, dare I use the word, medieval period in uh, Chinese history. Professor Takid's um, research, specialized um, area of research, uh, focuses upon the 10th century, especially the usage of uh, tomb inscriptions and steles, right? Tombs, inscriptions, and steles for the documenting of massive migrations all across North and Central China in the 10th century. Professor Takid, please. Um, so I want to begin by um, thanking Professor Zhang very much for this enlightening talk. I've actually been a, a long admirer of Professor Zhang's work. My um, own research in, in Tang history has benefited from um, his earlier research in um, Tang administrative history. Um, um, which, I, which has been um, enormously helpful to me. Um, now Professor Zhang is dealing with a, um, um, a, a fabulous new question with um, much broader significance, um, and that is um, issues of cultural exchange, especially cultural um, exchange involving China. Um, this topic is, of course, um, enormously relevant um, in today's world as well when we think of um, modern China's place um, in um, the global context um, and we think about how um, uh, Western intellectual cultures as well as um, political cultures um, um, uh, relate to um, Chinese intellectual and political cultures. Um, and when we think about how, um, th when we think about models of exchange um, in today's world. Um, however, um, as um, um, Professor Ye has noted, I am a medieval historian, so I um, personally may not care as much about um, today's world as, as some people. Um, <clears throat> so what I've, um, what I've found to be um, particularly um, interesting about um, Professor Zhang's way of thinking about um, cultural exchange involving religion is first of all, he pays attention both to um, government, um, the, the role of government in this process, that is uh, the relationship between the religious missionaries and the government, um, how religious missionaries sought um, the approval of the government, and this is particularly clear um, in the case of the um, rights controversy. Um, but he also deals with issues of um, um, successful missionizing um, to people um, in the broader society. And I think this is um, particularly obvious um, in his discussion of um, Buddhism. Um, so these are two different 
processes, and both of which one would imagine um, operates according to um, different um, dynamics. Um, Professor Zhang's emphasis on um, tolerance and flexibility, um, it seems to me, is a very interesting way of thinking about um, cultural interchange and about how, at the very early stages, um, people adopt new religious practices. Religions are, of course, um, particularly important in people's lives. Um, and so the question then is, how do, um, how do people come to accept different religions as valid, or practices and beliefs um, from different cultures as valid? Um, the comparison is between Buddhism, Nestorian Christianity, and um, Catholicism. Um, and of course, whereas Buddhism was wildly successful at um, integrating into Chinese culture, um, um, neither Nestorian nor Catholicism were as um, successful. This idea of um, tolerance can also be thought of as, um, shall we say, non-exclusivity, um, that is, um, to what extent are the religious practices, is the religion itself tolerant of um, being shared with other religious practices? Um, my, some of my own work has dealt with tombs and with burial practices, um, and I've looked at interactions between Chinese and um, steppe burial practices during the 11th century. Um, and I found that, by and large, tombs are either of the Chinese style, meaning they have, by and large, Chinese features, or they have um, um, steppe features. And the steppe features might include um, horse accoutrement or weapons contained within the tomb. Um, and you can actually um, do a chart of correlations and find that there's a very strong tendency for a tomb to either have Chinese or steppe features. Um, but when you do find tombs that have, that are hybridized and that share some features of both cultures, what I found interesting is that these, the tombs tend to place the objects associated with the different cultures in separate places within the tomb. Um, and this suggests that one way of, um, of um, having some sort of hybrid culture is through an accretionary process where rather than um, replacing one tradition with another, you are taking components of one tradition and adding it on to what you're um, already practicing or believing. Um, and in that sense, um, Buddhism in its integration into Chinese culture seems to have um, made use of such an accretionary process. Um, and that's most evident, I think, by the fact that um, there are plenty of Chinese who would um, um, follow both Buddhist and Taoist practices, for example. I think a, a very good example, very good recent example of that I was looking at a um, popular Hong Kong movie from the late 80s called The Chinese Ghost Story. Um, and in it, you have a Taoist monk who is um, battling the ghosts using a Buddhist sutra as, as a weapon. Um, and this seemed not to be a problem in this um, Hong Kong popular movie. And I imagine um, it wasn't a problem for many um, Chinese at the popular level. So this idea of non-exclusivity uh, may have been very important. On the other hand, if you think about the Western tradition, um, I haven't met many people who have um, sworn to me that they're both a Muslim and a Christian simultaneously. Um, maybe there are some exceptions out there, but I haven't um, encountered this on a, on a um, broad scale. So um, there is some difference in terms of, of, of these um, religious traditions. Another way of thinking about the flexibility of the Buddhist religion, it seems to me, is to think about the 
um, Buddhism and its, um, especially the, the Mahayana traditions of Buddhism um, have tended to um, focus on a variety of different um, sutras. And by focusing on one sutra rather than another, it's possible to um, interpret Buddhist thought in quite different ways. Um, and so if one thinks of the variety of Mahayana sutras that were available in um, Tang China and in earlier periods, this actually offered a variety of different forms of Buddhism that would have been available to um, China at the time, um, which meant that um, there would have been, almost by a process of natural selection, um, the greater possibility that one or two of these um, sutras might be particularly appealing in the Chinese um, context. Um, so I, I um, throw that out as another example of this um, flexibility. Um, so these are my, my thoughts. And I'd like to thank, again, very much Professor Zhang for his um, talk. <clears throat> Thank you, Nick. We now turn to our second um, commentator, uh, Dr. Orna Tsatrin. Uh, Orna uh, received her doctoral degree from Berkeley in art history in uh, 2009. Her earlier education included uh, specialization in European art history, and uh, she had taught, she had experience teaching art history in Mongolian National University before coming to Berkeley. So, Orna, please. Uh, I would also like to um, thank Professor Zhang for this very rich talk. And um, this was quite a learning experience. And I also enjoyed, at the same time, I learned a lot from this um, presentation. And because I'm an art historian, um, I look at images and I look at pictures. Uh, on one hand, um, Professor Zhang highlighted um, the integration or adaptation of these philosophical schools within China and ability or inability to integrate within Chinese culture and success or failure uh, connected with that ad uh, uh, ability. But on one, one, one hand, we have this picture of um, politicized tension between um, uh, Kansi Emperor on the level of the Emperor and of um, Pope. But on the other hand, at the same time uh, period, and even earlier in late Ming period, we have this amazing um, collaboration between Jesuits and the court, and um, which has very long-lasting imprint on Chinese culture. Um, and this smooth collaboration, which uh, happens on the both levels of uh, court um, and on literati level, even, even if, if we take only uh, one genre of Chinese art, portraiture, we see that collaboration happening on Chinese uh, imperial portraits and on the um, literati production uh, of officials' portraits starting from the late Ming period. That impact is, is ex extremely interesting and uh, even paradoxical if we think on the global level and if we see that difficulties of West to adapt and understand and integrate um, the Eastern pictorial um, differences into their own art on the same time period. And um, even leading to those tragic stories with the uh, artists in the West. And here in China, we have that amazing productivity of those cultures together. And even Matteo Ricci and his engravings that he brought to China had that long lasting influence, even in Southern China. So uh, my question would be uh, how, from historical point of view, and knowing that context of political hostility between those schools, and seeing that amazing collaboration on the level of culture and art, that would be interesting to, um, to ask Professor Zhang. Thank you very much, Orna. So um, 
Thank you, Orna. Um, I wonder if uh, Professor Zhang would like to uh, respond, offer a very brief response. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much for listening to us. 跟着多米南这个主导地位在这种前提下一切都好都然后进行这个平等的交流就能够有一个比较 他在台湾去写博士论文，他说中国人跟他讲，哎呀，你姑娘啊，你到那个庙里去，这个庙可神了，你到那个地方去，那个可灵了啊。这些中国人宗教观念呢，是欧洲人没有，美国人啊，西方
，他完全西化了，啊，也有可能的，也有可能，他最后就把这些人完全变成了一个西洋人，他长着中国人的样子，但是他完全变成西洋人了，呃，所以如果说那种冲突不夭折的话，也有可能出现这些，在中国人有部分中国人从小家里很穷，父母死了，他可能也是会是，他可能会出现这个情况的，讲太多了，你给讲。Um, in, oops, sorry. in answer, there's two main points. The first is that um, that culture, when we speak of questions of culture, there is no real absolute value or uh, absolute hierarchy which culture is better than the other. Um, and you might say that in China, there's a less concentrated um, religious concept or um, attachment to religion. Um, and so the the advent of Buddhism in in China did bring something new to the culture, and and this sort of new synthesis, for example, produced um, Chan, which is a sort of religion that did not exist at all um, in India or China before this period of contact. Um, so it's it's a I guess it's a concept of of something new and positive coming out of 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 contact that you'd like to. Emphasize, um, and the second point had to do uh, with the idea of um, cultural exchange occurring despite political interference, and there was a lot of shared knowledge with regards to science, astronomy, math, um, all of these interactions with the literati um, s s um, sort of strata of society as well, um, and there were interesting stories. Um, of you know the better off literati who were polygamists, I guess, and this was not allowed in Christian dictum. So some would divorce their wives once they converted, or decide not to become Christian until at one point they became sick and then divorced their second and third wives and then recovered, and so discovered this was a, a complete um, Lord's miracle. There are also cases very. Um, few cases of people who were brought up entirely with a Western Christian education and had the the um, the presence of Christianity not ended in China so abruptly, there may be more cases of people who were socialized entirely as as Westerners or Christians. Thank you. We have about two minutes before we will have to uh, close the session. So uh, please, let's take questions from the floor and then Ask Professor Zhang to respond. How's that? Uh, All right, please. War Guanyin originates. War Guanyin originates. OK. <laughs> question number one. Any other question? No other question? No? OK, please. Guanyin. This Guanyin is a woman in the Xi Mutan, she is a woman. But in fact, in the Indian Church, she is not a woman. She is a woman. 因为佛徒当初创立佛教的时候，女生是不能出出家的，女生后来才是的啊。呃，他是因为在在这个嗯呃呃佛典佛经里面有一有一有一有一品叫普门品，观世音普明品普门品，就是通通个佛经。这个佛经呢的内容是讲什么呢？它是讲很多故事，就是你只要念观世音。那么你就能逢凶化吉。比方说，现在这个房子起火了，你放一次经，念观世音经，这个火就会灭了。比如说你在大海的航行，大海航行呢，突然船坏了，你念观世音，哎，这个船就会好的。碰到墙的，嗯，你翻译吗 ？I'm sorry. Right. Right. But your question was about the origin of Guanyin. Uh, China Guanyin is because there is a Guanyin Book called Guanshi Yin Pu Min Pin. This Guanyin in Chinese. There is textual foundation to the doctrine concerning Guanyin, and Professor Zhang explains that Guanyin, that is the iconography coming out of India, was masculine, and then by the time it became a Chinese Buddhist goddess, ah, one sutra, one one Fo Jin, Fo Jin, in the sutra, following that, the sutra. And copy that from I know. No, she's not. 
Hmm. Other questions? Okay. Well, yes, please. Uh, this <laughs> <laughs> <笑>这个问题跟张教授的主题有多大的关系好 Okay, Nick, do you want to take that question very quickly? That is about the export of cultural <laughs> components from China to the West. Um, I mean, I, I haven't thought about that very much, but I'm all for it. I, my, uh, <laughs> my, my salary depends on, on people being interested in China in the West, and I'm... <laughs> I'm very much in support of that, about that general approach. <咳><咳><咳><咳><咳><咳><咳><咳><咳><咳> okay, so, yes, please. Okay,这是真对张教授的问题,因为张教授是报告人。好,我也是。其实教廷跟中国政府一直有接触的,就是宗教方面也接触的。中国也有一个叫三字爱国教会嘛,你知道。但是现在迟迟不能建立外交关系谢谢。简单的翻译一下。Yeah. Uh, the question is about the, the current relationship between the Vatican and the Chinese government. And the, very briefly, the answer was that there are many political considerations, mainly that the Vatican has diplomatic relationships with Taiwan and that cannot persist if the PRC is to have formal relations with it. Now, on that note, shall we thank Professor Zhang and the two commentators? <laughs> <laughs>